Wycliffe's Work for England. Chapter 6. By L. Lawrenson. The Poor Priests. We have already seen that Wycliffe's progress as a reformer began with his attacks upon the wicked practices of the priests of Rome. From the Pope downward he unsparingly exposed the hypocrisy of men who professed to be followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, and yet lived in pride, luxury, and sin. But by and by he came to see that not only were the deeds wrong, but that many of her doctrines were wrong also. And as he had now learned, in everything, to refer to the Word of God as the sole authority, he saw the importance not only of denying what was false but of affirming what was true. To do so, he was led to turn to that great plan first practiced by the Lord himself on the green hillsides of Galilee, and enjoined by him upon his disciples in all ages. Wycliffe's plan was to preach the word. But how could one man, and that man advanced in years, hope to reach many with the sound of the gospel? If he could not do it single-handed he could induce others to help. Sometime, then, between the years 1375 and 1380, that band of men were gathered together who were known as Wycliffe's poor priests. Rome, too, had her preachers, and they were found mostly among the friars. But they were by no means poor priests. They invaded the parishes of the secular clergy, who hated them just as bitterly as both combined hated the reformer. Under their wide flowing robes they carried large bags into which they put the gold, silver, or provisions they succeeded in begging from hall or hut wherever they went. They well deserved the name of mendicants. For their principal business was filling their wallets. Their preaching consisted in telling stupid, foolish, and fabulous stories of the lives of the saints, too silly to repeat in our pages, or legends from the siege of Troy. Afterwards, they spent their time in the alehouses or at the gaming table. When they came into a town, they proclaimed to all that they had power from the Pope to pardon all sin. Relics of wonderful virtue were produced from among their other treasures capable of performing all kinds of cures, either upon man or beast. These relics usually consisted of old sheep's bones or other similar rubbish. But though easily procured and easily carried, they were parted with for one commodity only money, and still more money. And one of the curious things about them was that if you purchased your old bone for silver your crops increased only twofold, but if you gave the rascal friar gold for his old bone, then, in some way which neither he nor we can explain, your crops increased fourfold. So the wily friar defrauded the poor people, enriched his greedy order, and offended a holy God. In all this we see but a baptized paganism, much worse than even that of heathen Rome. In the good old days of Rome, the priest believed what he preached. Here we find men who knew that they were deceiving the simple people, yet deliberately continuing to do so in order that they themselves might amass wealth by robbing the poor. Wycliffe's poor priests seem to have been friends like-minded with himself who had gathered round him while he was at Oxford. We get a glimpse of them as men traveling barefoot. Their clothing usually consisted of a long russet gown reaching down to the heels, without pockets. The last two words remind us of our Lord's instructions to the seventy disciples sent out to preach the gospel, Luke 10, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. This seems to have been the model on which the Wycliffe preachers were formed, and it might truly be said that they went forth as lambs among wolves. The bishops had recourse to their usual weapon persecution, and had a law passed for any king's officer to arrest the preachers and commit them to prison. The parish priests and friars, though they agreed on little else, agreed on this and acted as policemen. When the humble evangelist began to preach, they set off for assistance. But the gospel was a sweet sound in the ears of the people, and they at least had a welcome for the preacher, so that oft times when the king's officer appeared to arrest him, a body of stout men stood forth surrounded their preacher, and bore him off in safety. When persecuted in one place the devoted missionaries fled to another, and, whether seated in castle hall or beside cottage hearth, whether preaching to the crowd at the crossway or to the merchant in the busy mart, they spoke of full and free salvation by grace alone, not of works lest any man should boast. It was hardly to be expected that seeing all the corruptions both of life and doctrine which Rome had introduced they would abstain from attacking her errors. And here indeed there was scope and matter for all their fiery indignation. There was the hypocrisy of the friars, who pretended to be poor men, but who were bent only on enriching their order. 
There was the worldliness of the higher clergy, who were more interested in state preferment than in performing their spiritual duties. There was the pollution and degradation of the papal court itself, which instead of setting a standard of righteousness was at that time sunk in the lowest depth of infamy. Then it became their duty to warn the ignorant people that payment of money to a priest or friar could not put away sin, and that the worship of images was no part of Christianity, but only a pagan practice introduced by Rome. How very true this charge was can easily be verified. Rome taught then, and teaches now, that without baptism there can be no salvation. She thus makes the way of salvation baptism instead of the Lord Jesus who alone could say, I am the way. So far is this false doctrine pressed that even infants are included, in express denial of the beautiful words, suffer little children, and forbid them not, to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19 verse 14. Rome's fond deceit is, justification by works, but the scriptures say, by him all that believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses, Acts 13 verse 39. The heathen nations of old were required by their priests to do works of penance and self-mortification, even cutting their flesh with knives like the priests of Baal, whom we read about in 1 Kings 18 verse 28. So Rome teaches that God is not satisfied without tortures of the body and penances without number. But this is a denial of the value of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the precious blood that alone cleanses from all sin. Again, we read that just as there is one God, so there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, but Rome puts the Virgin Mary in a higher place than the Lord himself. A well-known Romanist tells his readers that the sinner who ventures to come directly to Christ may come with dread and apprehension of his wrath, but that if he comes through Mary, the wrath of her son will be at once appeased. In the days of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 44 verse 19, the paganism of the heathen nations had invaded Judea, and women were seen offering cakes to the Queen of Heaven. The same scripture gives us the origin of Rome's blasphemous Massachusetts. The cakes that were offered to the Queen of Heaven were small, round, thin wafers, the pattern of which we have with us today in Rome's wafer god. The doctrine of purgatory and prayers for the dead comes from the same heathen source. Neither the one nor the other is found in the Bible, but both go hand in hand with Rome, for they are two of her best money-making devices. For no prayers are of any value except the priest's prayers, but no pay no prayer, so that unless the priest be well paid, purgatory holds the victim. It is difficult to write calmly about this atrocious system of deliberately making merchandise of the tenderest feelings of the human heart sorrowing over departed loved ones. Priests of paganism in Egypt or in Greece, priests of the Jews, or priests of papal Rome have all alike been adepts at devouring widows' houses. Again, the idol worship of Rome might well arouse the indignation of men who had learned the truth of Scripture for themselves. A Romish procession, bearing a figure either of the Virgin Mary or some other saint, might well remind us of what Isaiah says, they lavish gold out of the bag, and weigh silver in the balance, and hire a goldsmith, and he mocketh at a god, they fall down, yeah, they worship. They bear him upon the shoulder, they carry him, and set him in his place, and he standeth, from his place he shall not remove. Pagan idolatry in principle has been deliberately annexed by Rome. Now, all these things were the recognized order of things in papal England in the 14th century, and we have to thank God that we are in some measure delivered from it, and think ourselves too wise to go back to it, yet Rome today is making an insidious, determined, and untiring effort to reintroduce the same conditions into this Protestant land. Alas for men's poor man-made religion in contrast to the glorious gospel of the blessed God concerning His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. His finished work on Calvary settles every question of sin, both to the glory of God and the blessing of men, and He is today the only Savior of sinners. From the glory He is saying today, Come unto me and I will give you rest.